1940. Uh, you joined the U.S. Army Air, Air Corps. Corps. Okay. Where did you uh, do your basic training? Never had one day of basic training. Go ahead. Why not? Should I pick it up and just yeah, run with go it? Ahead, go ahead. Okay. Two other fellows and myself just decided to join the military and uh, take a long trip somewhere at the expense of our country and uh, then come home as soon as we could. In those days, you could buy yourself out after one year for a token sum, which was quite large then. So we uh, went to Bridgeport to enlist. And they turned us down because they had no openings. They didn't know a war was raging. And then we proceeded to New Haven. We're told the same thing. And he said, possibly you can find some openings in Hartford. So we drove to Hartford. This is all one day. We arrive in Hartford, the federal building. And the fella recruiting said, you're very lucky. I have three openings in the Philippines. You are lucky. So we said, wonderful, that sounds like a nice long trip. And we then enlisted. We reported to Fort Slogan, New Rochelle, the island lying off New Rochelle. Uh, what's that fort? Fort Slocum. S-L-O? C-O-M. OK. And we just hung around and dressed up like soldier boys with no training whatsoever and nothing to do. And we had to beg for a pass to go ashore to New Rochelle if we wanted to see our lost loves before we left for the Philippines. How but long were you there? We were there from October until January 2nd, 41, when we boarded a troop transport at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and sailed off to the Philippines. We stopped in South Carolina and picked up a bunch of poor things from the hills dressed in World War I woolens. And as they came aboard, we couldn't believe what we were seeing with their choke colors in, this <laughs> in the warm south. We arrived we sailed down the coast, stopped in Panama, and then on to San Francisco, and they kept us on an island in San Francisco Bay until they had an available transport, which happened to be one that we confiscated from the Germans in World War I, an ancient freighter called the U.S. Grant. We blew a soldier head off Hawaii in a typhoon and limped in there and spent 10 days stuck in tents, the same routine as Fort Slogan or the island in San Francisco Bay. Couldn't get off the base, surrounded with barbed wire. They were afraid we might go over the hill, as they said in those days. So on we went. Stopping in Guam, which was the first time in years they permitted a transport of troops, as they call them today, to come ashore. You had to go in in small boats because there were, was no pier. And they had two industries, Coca-Cola and rum. So you can imagine what happened during our visit. It was a grade B movie scene tearing the whole t of the town of Agata, the capital, tearing it up, every bar room. So on we went from there and arrived in Manila, March of 41, after that long journey, January 2nd to March. I forget the day, but it was the uh, first week in March. Again, the farce was repeated when we were transported to tents at what is, was called Nichols Field, just outside of Manila. We were put up in tents in a swamp and had to put the legs of the cots in buckets of water to keep the red ants from eating us alive. 
And again, we had to wait to go out and see what the world was in Manila. So I won't get into all those details, but uh, finally, about October, they finished building a wooden barracks for us, and the effort should have been put into building the defenses instead of the barracks. There we were when Manila, when, pardon me, when Pearl Harbor was hit, and we left the barracks during the 17 hours that we had as a warning time before the bombs fell on the Philippines. In that 17 hours, our top management, led by General MacArthur, went into a total panic state in Manila, couldn't make a decision on launching our 35 bombers to the known targets where the Japs were going to take off from. MacArthur refused to give permission to our Air Corps general, who wanted to at least try to bomb the Jap targets because Pearl Harbor had already been bombed. But no, they finally gave permission when the bombs were falling already on Clark Field and Nichols Field, wiping out the U.S. Army Air Corps with one stroke. The Jap aircraft were able to stay over the target in a leisurely manner back and forth till they annihilated everything, all the aircraft, all the fuel supplies, and lots of men, of course. And we had nothing to fight with. Let me just back up. Yeah. Um, what did you, um, what were your duties between um, March and Pearl Harbor? <laughs> duties. We would march like the king's horses and king's men. We would march from the tents to the airstrip and wipe wings and do other silly things such as learning how to change oil and service the aircraft and march back again before noon and that was our day even though war was raging in the world. It was a leisurely state. We also had to assemble the P-40 modern aircraft that they had sent us in pieces and we had a colonel who fortunately was an aeronautical engineer by training, and he organized teams to assemble these planes. Believe it or not, that late. Then our pilots, who were old men to us, but they were in their early 20s and mid-20s, had to learn to fly them. And in the course of their learning, they killed more pilots than died in combat because the P-40 was a difficult plane to fly after flying a rotary engine plane. It was nose heavy with a, a, a liquid-cooled Allison engine, and as they turned to make their landing approach, they would forget to put enough power on and plow into the ground instead. So that was another blundering episode of mismanagement. We had no modern anti-aircraft guns. They had plenty of time to send them to us. That was the 5-inch 38 gun, which was deadly in those days. We had 3-inch World War I anti-aircraft guns, and they were uh, very small numbers, and it was a National Guard anti-aircraft regiment from New Mexico that was federalized, and they arrived a few weeks before the Japs struck. So they had no preparation training, and they had too few guns. They were all manual operated and plotted. We had World War I infantry water-cooled Browning machine guns for anti-aircraft defense. And there was one 20 millimeter that we could hear firing during the raid. We don't know who even manned it. <laughs> but that was the only mighty defensive weapon we had and the Japs brushed it off like brushing away flies, and they would just proceed down and low as possible so they wouldn't miss targets, and back and forth till they destroyed everything. We then were, but I should back up, myself, along with my squadron, were called anti-aircraft defense now that the aircraft were destroyed. And we manned these, not only the World War I liquid-cooled Browning machine guns, but the really ancient British 
<laughs> I, I believe the British gun with the drum on, 90 round drum on top, I forgot the name of it, predated World War I. But it was <laughs> totally inaccurate, but it made noise. And I was put on one which had three of them rigged up to a piece of angle iron, which was an improvisation by our armorers. And they stuck three uh, on the pieces of angle iron welded to a metal pole, I guess some kind of pipe. And I had a placement surrounded with sandbags above the ground. All of our emplacements were above ground. No preparation whatsoever for the real world, for the real war. So when the Japanese attacked, thank God I had left my position to get coffee. The coffee truck had arrived. And I had a canteen cup of coffee in my hand, first in line behind the truck, boiling hot coffee just as they hit. I was so far from my gun emplacement I couldn't make it. I think I just threw the coffee in the air and dove into the ground. And thank God I didn't make it because it was blown totally away. As was all the other ridiculous anti-aircraft defenders. <laughs> Everything was in flames, the whole airfield was burning. And uh, there were a few surviving planes in the revetments we had built. They should have been scattered all over, small airfields all over the Philippines, but they didn't know enough to in those days. So, we stayed there from that attack, which was December 8 in the Philippines, until Christmas Eve of 1941. We got on trucks after dark, went to Manila. We were going to be transported to Australia. That was the word. <laughs> we got on inter-island boats, Filipino boats, which was the only type of transportation available. And a handful of the remaining aircraft were flying. The air raid warning went off and we thought it was the Japs and we were all trapped in this port area waiting for the boat. But thank God it was the few remaining P-40s flying above us to defend us. I don't think they would have been able to if they'd been attacked though. So the next morning we thought we were, must be well on our way to Australia. We wound up off the tip of Bataan Peninsula across Manila Bay from Manila. And we landed there, not knowing where the devil we were. And we marched up the road to an encampment and piled up what little supplies we had brought with us. Christmas dinner was for myself and three or four other fellows was a can of tomatoes, as I recall. That was it. From there, we marched into the jungle to take our defensive position up. And I have a photograph of myself getting off the truck which appeared in Life magazine, believe it or not. And we had been informed by our intelligence people that 100 Japanese had landed the night before and we were gonna clean them out, 200 plus ground crews of <laughs> the Air Corps, untrained totally, not one day of any kind of proper <laughs> basic training. We hardly know which end the bullet came out as the saying goes. And the rifles were World War I Springfield 03s. All our equipment was left over World War I garbage. The ammunition mostly was corroded, of course, and the hand grenades wouldn't go off. One out of ten would go off. They were so ancient. We marched into the jungle to throw these hundred Japs back in the water, talking at the top of our lungs, single file, till the man in the lead hit the beach on the coast of Bataan. Then the trees erupted. They were up in the trees all around us. And it turned out there weren't a hundred Japanese, there were 5,000. 
one Air Corps basic ground crew simulated infantry. We were called, incidentally, by a title, the Provisional Air Corps Infantry Regiment, which has never been acknowledged by the United States Army to this day. They refuse to designate us as infantry and refuse to give us combat infantry badges to this day because we were designated Air Corps, <laughs> even though we turned into infantry the first day. So we're very upset about that and have been since 1945. We naturally did the brave thing and retreated as fast as we could back the way we came and got our asses out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Only a handful of casualties, even though there were thousands of Japs. They didn't know how few we were. They had no idea. And they heard all this noise and thought, my God, it must be a massive force there. <laughs> Instead of it was just innocent kids jabbering away. We then were relieved by the finest trained infantry in the world, Filipinos. Filipino scouts rated the best in the world against anyone else, even the vaulted Nazis. They said as they came in behind us, Joe, don't worry, we'll take care of them. And they took care of them. How many of those? They slaughtered all the Japs. No, how, many, how many scouts were there? We have no idea oh. to this day. But it was probably around a regiment. And they surrounded the Japs and simply pushed them off into the sea whence they came, only they weren't living anymore. And the jungle was denuded by them as they blasted their way through. We then took up the position of defense on the coast. Filipinos bid us adieu and went on to other affairs that they were going to save the Americans from disaster. We waited there for the next landing, which came, and while we were waiting, our armorers got a hold of 50 caliber guns from our destroyed P-40 aircraft. And they managed to improvise manual cocking, because they were electronically charged on the aircraft, and again, use some magic of creating a water pipe into, or some kind of pipe, <laughs> into the, uh, the uh, what would you call it? The tripod? Or the tripods, the right. I couldn't think of the word. And they were lined up on the beach with these four 50 caliber air-cooled guns set to fire across the water at about three feet, as I recall. We were flanking them with our 30 caliber rifles on each side. And here they came. They estimated there were about 60 large barges coming in and they made a, such a noise that you couldn't mistake them. They sounded like the famous Palmer engines from my childhood. They must have been one-cylinder engines on the barges because they made a chug-chugging sound of a single cylinder. And the Japs didn't seem to worry about anyone defending the coast because when they got close enough, they started throwing the mortars at us. And we had been smart enough at this point to know enough to dig holes. So we were all in spider holes. And the mortars flew over our heads and exploded behind us, thank God. So when they got in close enough, the, the uh, armorers opened up with our 50 caliber air-cooled and just destroyed the barges. And the poor remaining Japs who weren't drowned the, or, or uh, shot by the first barrage of the 50s and wound up in the water were picked off by our Springfield <laughs> rifles at that point. A few got ashore, and we actually captured a few. They did surrender, even though the Japs were supposed never to surrender. 
and they were delighted to find out we didn't kill them. We even fed them from our meager rations. And getting back to the meager rations, from our first day of my uh, description of having the Christmas dinner with the can of tomatoes, it got worse. <laughs> the grand general staff of the Philippines had forgotten to get the food into Bataan in time, even though General MacArthur had designed the defensive plan while he was superintendent of the military academy at West Point. That was a carefully planned defensive maneuver to pull into Bataan because you couldn't defend 7,000 islands with the small amount of defenders that he had and known that they were never going to send the proper armaments there. Whenever the army or the military command gave any indication of rearming the Philippines properly, the Jap would protest and the guns never got there, the proper defensive weaponry. We listened to their protests and acted accordingly. We had treaties with them after all. That's what we're having to do now. We want to have another nice treaty with the Russians. And no one pays attention to treaties, of course. So, 10 million tons of provisions made it to Kabatadawan, just north of Bataan. And that's where it was captured by the Japanese. All the food that was supposed to supply the needs of all the military and all the civilian Filipinos who lived on Bataan, giving the Navy time, this was the plan, to break through and relieve Bataan. Of course, there was no Navy left at that point except one or two ships. <laughs> what, did you, what food did you have? Our first day of true rations prepared by our mess sergeant and his cooks was a mess kit about three quarters filled with liquid rice to make it go farther and flavored with some kind of uh, fish, canned meat or fish, probably about one large can for 200 plus men. The weight fade fell off our bodies so quickly that we, it wasn't long before we had lost almost 30 or 40 percent of our, of our known weight. We were riddled with dysentery, malaria, dinghy fever, and jungle rot while living out in the open in the jungle. Our helmets, World War II style, were our pillows and wash basins. We slept on the ground from December 24 till the end of Bataan, which was April 9 of 42. Our truly great hero general, Edward King, who was the true defender of Bataan, even though MacArthur got all the credit after paying one visit for approximately an hour to Bataan, the newspapers in the United States gave him total accolades because the propaganda sent by Washington, the hero of Bataan. But Edward King was the hero of Bataan. He set up the positions, held them as long as possible, and then made strategic retreats. He had the Filipino 155 artillery guns strategically set so that by February, the Japs were almost totally destroyed by our defense. They suffered huge casualties. The battles of Bataan essentially faded away to just skirmishes from there on until the Japs resupplied and rebuilt the force, bringing their troops from Malaysia, where the English had surrendered in weeks. We held out from December 24th to April 9th of 42. Some experts in the world, military historians, have stated, many have in fact stated, that our defense saved Australia. Because if the Jap juggernaut had not been stopped in the Philippines, 
it would have flowed south very quickly. And there was no defense in Australia to stop it, none whatsoever. They had overran all the English positions in Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and most of Indonesia, which is, uh, it was the a possession of the Dutch at that time. Nothing would have stopped them. And when Australia fell, nothing would have gotten through to take back the Pacific because they would have had the greatest defensive platform imaginable. And they had millions of highly trained military personnel to repel any, def any attack on uh, Australia. So we did it. We, we were told that we did it, and we think we did. Let me ask you a question here. Yeah. Uh, between the 24th of uh, December 41 until April 9th, 42, you were under constant attack by the Japanese? Land, sea, and air. They commanded the sea and the air. If anything moved on the ground, it was bombed or strafed. The slightest movement. They were floating over the jungle constantly. We had no anti-aircraft. If they spotted a blue barracks bag, that was before <laughs> they just woke up and, <laughs> and died them. <laughs> but a blue bag was very easily spotted from the air. We had 150 caliber water cool from a sunk naval small uh, tugboat or uh, whatever it was, a small naval ship. And we recovered it and mounted it on the highest point where our defense was. And a kid who never had fired one before in his life was on it one day when the Jap observer came over and he shot it out of the sky with his 50 caliber water cooler. That was the mightiest anti-aircraft barrage in history. <laughs> he had to get it out of there because it would have been destroyed immediately. In fact, it probably was, I don't recall. But that was our air defense. We didn't dare shoot back with our rifles or our World War I <laughs> water cooled 30 calibers because that would have brought an immediate response. So we were, we were just hunted down varmints in the jungle as far as the Japs were concerned, but we had slaughtered them enough and they were so weakened by the loss of personnel to the Filipino artillery and the 30 caliber World War I rifles and machine guns that they had to stop. They had no more offensive capability except for skirmishes. They had the air constantly, they had the sea, but there was a so almost a phony war until they rebuilt. And when they rebuilt that final week of the defense of Bataan and launched their final attack, it was overwhelming and it was against starved skeletons who could, who had no energy left, even though MacArthur had ordered the commanders in the Philippines on Bataan to attack, attack, attack. So <laughs> our commanding officers knew a little better. What, with what? <laughs> we could hardly walk. We were nothing but skeletons and raging fever with was rampant throughout the defense. The men in the so-called hospitals were lying on the ground and in cots. And I have a great photograph from life, how the Bataan wounded lived in pain. It's in that bundle I'm going to give you. One of the worst killers of those poor bastards in the hospitals was gangrene, something that had been almost exposed as a passe in wartime, we'd learned how to combat it. Civil wars, gangrene took most of the casualties, was responsible for most of the deaths. Anyway. Uh, do you, you had no doctors? Oh. <laughs> we had doctors. They had nothing. They improvised. They were mostly Navy doctors, and they did their damnedest. They would wrap the legs 
covered with rot in filthy bandages and use maggots to hopefully clean up the wounds to save the legs. So that was uh, primitive medicine they were performing. Yeah. Of, of all the men of the unit that started in the 24th of December until April 9th, approximately how many were uh, casualties? Of my organization? Yes. Just the 17th Pursuit? That was the name of my organization. Yeah. I have no idea. We were so scattered in the jungle, you were lucky to know two or three guys within shouting distance. We had one character from Maine stationed on a trail with an air-cooled 30 caliber at a strategic location. And you could hear him hollering when he fired his gun. This is why we were really killing the Japs. He was taking such great delight. He was screaming at the top of his lungs and you could hear his gun going. He lived to get home to Maine. What, do, you, do you know his name? I don't remember. Oh, it was either De Cato or De Lyle. They were all Frenchmen who had enlisted up there. De Cato, De Cato, De Lyle, Du Plessis. <laughs> there were more D's in our organization. <laughs> New England boys. Incidentally, that ship that left January 2nd from Brooklyn was full. New England, New York, and then we picked up the South Carolinians and, and packed it still full. So we stayed out on deck most of the voyage all the way to, to San Francisco. And of that ship, today, I would guess there may be five or six alive of that full ship, because in total, there are rumored to be only 50-ish of us alive out of the 37,000 who were surrendered to the Japanese, Americans. Roughly 37,000 in the entire Philippines were surrendered by Wainwright. General Wainwright was the final commander after MacArthur left. Jonathan, treated like dirt by MacArthur. His final order to Wainwright was, charge! <laughs> With what? <laughs> ah, where did we leave off? Well, we left off at oh, 9th of April. Here we go now. We were ordered to report to the tip of Bataan, a place called Marvelous Village. M -A -R -V -E. Marvelous, do it phonetically. M-A-R-V-E-L-I-U-S, I think, Marvelous. That's where we were supposed to line up and be ready for the Japs to take us under control. The orders came to destroy your weapons, your personal weapons, your rifle, your pistol, and report there. So Bataan was chaos that day. All the ammunition dumps of artillery shells that were left because we had no more guns to use the artillery shells, but we had a large store of shells and they blew them all up. So it was, and then there was a slight earthquake simultaneous with the fall of Bataan. There was an abs, actually a real earthquake. So the sound of the bombs being blown up and the feeling of the earthquake was, uh, Totally terrifying, should I say. And we're straggling down, if you can picture the scene, through the jungle, loose groups straggling down to report for the fate of being a prisoner. When I got to the tip, a few of us decided we had no interest in becoming prisoners till it was absolutely mandatory. <laughs> So we went out on a tip of land that stuck into Manila Bay, and we got to the very tip of it. It was all rocks, sort of a breakwater, and we hid among the, rock, the uh, stones until dark. And in the meantime, a ship was burning in Manila Bay, loaded with bombs that they were, had tried to get out before the Japs landed in the Philippines to get it to Australia. 
There were 4,000 tons of bombs on that ship, and the Jap set it on fire because it couldn't get out of the harbor or, or Manila Bay. And it, the Japs had it blockaded totally. So they turned back and anchored, and the Japs set it on fire, and a young uh, American officer who was supposed to be in authority, a second lieutenant, announced to us, he was with us on this breakwater, that don't worry, fire will not ignite bombs. So <laughs> we had the crew of that ship with us, and they had pulled their lifeboats up onto the breakwater and covered them with camouflage as much as possible. But boom, the ship exploded. It was 40% of the force of a Hiroshima bomb, 4,000 tons. Hiroshima bomb was about 10,000 tons. The resulting firestorm ignited the whole shore of Manila Bay, or Marvelous Harbor, anyway, not the whole bay. And a miniature tsunami poured over our point caused by this enormous explosion. We were huddled under our World War I pancake helmets, <laughs> and it rained down on us, fragments of the ship, fiery fragments. The sky was just black and red from the residue of the explosion. And actually, you could hear the, the fragments popping on your, on your helmet. So you huddled under it best you could. When it became dark, the crew of that ship put the lifeboats in the water. We loaded up. I was hanging on the sides. They were up to the gunnels, as they say, as we made our way across to Corregidor, the fortress of the Pacific. <laughs> That's where the Philippine government had retreated to and MacArthur had retreated to, and they were all there. <laughs> Anything that moved in the water before dark was strafed, so we had to wait till dark, and the water was covered. Several hundred of us were making it, hanging on to lifeboats, swimming, holding on to debris of one kind or another. And when we hit the shore, the rocky shore of Corregidor, we were challenged by a marine Corps, Fourth Regiment Guard. <laughs> Who goes there? <laughs> I think he made the crack. You're in the Marine Corps now. <laughs> so we were assigned to various Marine Corps companies throughout the island, and mine was under Captain Schaffner, who was known as Shifty Schaffner from his days as an All-American football player. And we were immediately facing where we had come, Bataan. And I was again assigned to a machine gun. <laughs> again, <laughs> only this time it was a modern World War I water-cooled Marine Corps infantry weapon, not the air-cooled English model I had. <laughs> we would go down to the rocks. Each morning we'd lower ourselves on a rope down this steep cliff to man the gun. And before dawn, we would go back up because they would shell when daylight occurred. Shortly after dawn, the, the shelling would start. The shelling of Corregidor was so massive that Corregidor, before it started, was a jungle-covered island with python up to 30-odd feet found on it. Bring them back alive, Frank Buck used to capture them there. This thick jungle-covered island was reduced to a site like a World War I battlefield. All the vegetation was gone. The most immense artillery bombardment on uh, per foot, I guess, in history. The Japs had brought down to the tip of Bataan large numbers of 240 millimeter guns and huge numbers of 105s, and they were firing point blank at us. Our guns had been all destroyed. One huge 
Coast Artillery gun that was just behind us in the hill behind where our defensive position was located was hit so many times the Japanese 240s finally penetrated through this huge reinforced concrete covering of the magazine. The gun had already been destroyed because it was out in the open. All these huge Coast Artillery guns on Corregidor were in the open. Magnificent, very smart defense. It was a Spanish-American World War I type defense. And <laughs> the Japs would just plunk the shells in steadily, one after another, or many, many dozen rounds after another, until they totally destroyed each of the big guns systematically. When that magazine went up, the entire island seemed to rise up several feet in the air, and it rained us with debris. We were below it. And one of our guys was buried alive, and a Marine Corps cook, a regular Marine, a real Marine from the 4th Regiment, <laughs> dug him out. They both survived. And the guy that was buried alive is, was on the police force of Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Uh, recently, was it Pawtucket or Woonsocket? Anyway, he just died a couple of years ago, and his liberator who dug him out died about 10 years ago. Great story. Yeah. May the 6th came and the Japs got tanks ashore. We destroyed many of their landing craft and thousands of Japs were killed in the defense those final 30 days, but actually the final day when they were making their landing. And it was the anti-aircraft men from New Mexico who had their guns leveled and fired them on a flat trajectory, point blank, at the Jap landing. So the shrapnel was exploding over their heads. The rumor was 15,000 Japs died in the landing. I know the bodies were in enormous numbers, and that was our big job after the surrender to burn the bodies. We piled them up in huge piles. This was and, required by the Japanese. Oh yeah, that was our first major slave labor performance, burning the Jap bodies. And there were a lot of them. They were angry. They were very angry because we had put up this defense on Bataan, which caused them to lose tremendous faith in Tokyo. And then on Corregidor, again, the 30 days it took for them to take it and the number of casualties made them very angry. So <laughs> they, they forced the defenders of Corregidor, approximately 10 to 12,000, into this couple of acre area, which was a truck depot covered with concrete and uh, it had a couple of large garages and it was totally destroyed from the shelling, all the uh, structures. But here were 10 or 12,000 of us packed into this thing, a couple of acres of concrete on the edge of the water. So you couldn't go anywhere in the water and you couldn't go anywhere in the land because they set up a perimeter of machine guns to keep you penned in. And there was no food issued. There was one half inch water pipe for 10 or 12,000 men. The sanitation facilities were pits we dug, and if you can picture 10 or 12,000 people with dysentery, totally, totally consumed with dysentery and malaria, squatting around these open pits, some fell in, they slid backwards into it, there was no way of saving them, they just disappeared. If you went in the water to wash yourself off, because defecation was everywhere, covered the ground, you had to push it aside with your arms because the surface of the water was covered with it. So that we endured for about two or three weeks. I forgot exactly. But it wasn't very pleasant. And I almost died from yellow jaundice. I didn't know what it was, but one of the guys from Maine saved my life and his name was Hinckley. 
from Hinkley, Maine. He was a member of our squadron. He went outside the perimeter where the Japs had the men piling up food from the tunnels on Cregidor, where the food was stored for the officer staff and the hospital uh, inmates. And there was quite a bit of food still stored there. They had no idea how long they were going to have to hold out, so they were on a strict ration, but it was far better than what the ration we had on Batan. So he actually stole a box of sugar from this food pile and made me eat the whole box. He had known that sugar somehow would fight against the jaundice in the bloodstream, and it saved me. It cleared it up, which was an amazing thing. Yeah. So I went to look up his family one day in Maine, and I couldn't find any, but he had, he had died a horrible death in one of these slave camps at Nichols Field, where they pumped him full of water and then jumped on him. They were the Jap Marines, the Japanese Naval Landing Force, they were called. They were the Japanese Marines, Mur most miserable, murderous bastards in history. Totally merciless. So, so here we go now. They're going to evacuate us from the island, and we had to walk out in the water and climb aboard these small boats that they brought. I don't know what they were, but we had to climb up out of the water, and it was up to our necks. And then after the boats were packed, it would bring us into the shore of Manila along the main boulevard, which was called Dewey Boulevard, after the famous admiral who sank the Spanish fleet. <laughs> we were jumped, so told to jump over the side in water up to our necks, some, some areas even deeper, and walk up to Dewey Boulevard. It was right along the coastline. And as we were lined up there, the trucks, uh, Japanese officers came, on horseback with drawn swords and herded us through the throngs of Filipinos who lined the streets to watch the crushed Americans go by. It was all staged by the Japs. They had their journalists filming it and the Jap officers with drawn swords would whack us as they went by. This was quite a sight of propaganda film being made for the benefit of the people of Japan to show the crushed and all the peoples of Southeast Asia. Remember, this was called the Greater Far East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. That was the propaganda of the Japs. We're going to liberate you from the white man, the oppressors, and we will show you paradise under our reign. <laughs> <laughs> they were the worst despots in the history of the world, far worse than any Western uh, occupier. So, so they, they we marched us through the streets of Manila to show the Filipinos the crushed white man and the rest of the world of Asia. And eventually we got to a railhead and they packed us into metal ancient small rail cars such as the type used on the narrow gauge rails in Europe, the 40 and 8, you know. And then they slammed the doors closed in this merciless tropical sun. So here we were packed together in these cars so you couldn't, couldn't move. You were literally forced to stand straight and the defecation and urine just flowing down on the floor if you could picture in total darkness. And the, the cars started to roll and we came to one spot where they stopped to allow us to perform. And if you urinated before permission was given, they would attack with the bayonet. To set an example. And here were these subhuman creatures covered with defecation, stumbling off the car. And after one stop, there wasn't another until we got to the point where we were thrown out to march to 
the prison camp at Kabatatawan. This was slightly better a destination than the one the Bataan remaining forces who, who had surrendered were brought to after the infamous death march on Bataan. That was simply the evacuation of Bataan. It was given the name Death March by journalists in Australia when Shifty Shafter, my commander, and nine other guys broke out of a Jap camp in one of the southern islands and under a subterfuge pretending they were going to work with their tools over their shoulder, they saluted the Jap guards as they marched out from where they were kept to sleep and got permission to go, Shigoto, uh, that's work. <laughs> And the Jap guard would say, <laughs> and off they'd go, and they never stopped. They went out through an impenetrable jungle, and they all broke up, the ten of them, and they finally reached the same destination. It was a miracle. They killed a few Jap guards on the way. And they appeared at a Filipino village, which, by the grace of God, had no sympathizers of the Japs. It was so isolated. They loved Americans, and they had a radio and they radioed Australia. Okay. And getting to a Filipino village, and the Filipinos had a radio, and they, they called Australia, or they Morse coded Australia, and a submarine was dispatched and picked up these 10 guys. They made it to Australia. They were interviewed, and as a result of the interviews, a journalist coined the title of the experience they had been through, the Bataan Death March, an all-encompassing term to describe not just that evacuation of Bataan, but their time in the prison camps up to that point. Now this was 43, two years from the start of the war for the United States in the Philippines. Oh, so let me make sure I have this right. Shifty escaped in 43. 43 with the nine other fellows. Okay. That was 1943. This was the first word that the folks at home finally got to know we were alive. A bamboo curtain had dropped over the Pacific and the Japs weren't telling whether we were alive. They just simply knew we were incarcerated in their power, but no one knew whether we had survived until those interviews in Australia. And the newspapers throughout the United States then knew the story and described the murderous raid of the Japanese in bold headlines. You don't know the month that happened, do you? No, I don't. But it was the first time the Washington and the people of this country knew that we were alive. So you had had no contact with the outside world? Oh, God, no. No. Nope. So, you were. where are we now? We're at Kabatatawan because the folks who were evacuated from Bataan by the Japs so they could bring in their huge artillery and all the rest of their forces to attack Kregidor. On the way down, they were smashing the heads of the fellows walking by on the so-called death march just for the sport of it. They'd, they'd hold two by fours out the trucks, whacking them as they went by. Uh, they killed 10,000 Filipinos and about 3,000 Americans on that march. But it was the overwhelming number of dead were the Filipinos. They got to the camp called O'Donnell, which had been a Filipino sort of a National Guard training camp, such as the training they got, which wasn't much. And the Japs packed 100,000 Filipinos and Americans into that place 
and 26,000 died in six weeks of dysentery, malaria, starvation. The dogs ate the bodies at night. They would pop to the surface. The Jap commander told the American commander who begged for mercy, begged for medicine, for food, for water, I want you all to die. The son of a bitch was only persuaded to close that camp and allow them out when his own men started to die from the disease that was spreading rapidly because the flies would coat the faces of the seriously ill masked or on the, matted on the faces. They'd already been feasting on open sores and defecation and uh, they were in the eyes and the mouths and so on. And at night, the, the burial there grew to five or six hundred a day at the worst point before it slowed down gradually. <laughs> we were packed into camp Kabata de Wan, where 3,000 Americans died also. Same kind of conditions. And this was almost all Americans at Kabata de Wan. I forget how many West Point, oh, it was almost 150 West Point officers, graduates of West Point, died at Commander One. Such a waste. Murdered, period. They were all murdered. When I held a ceremony at the Washington Monument, that incidentally was where the railhead was located where all that food was stored that was supposed to be shipped into Bataan to prepare for the defense of Bataan until the U.S. Navy could break through. But the Japanese, oh, I called them Japanese, captured all of that food. Our idiot high-ranking officers in command blew it. As I've described, Previously, I'm sorry, fellas. You're all gone, I'm sure, by now. <laughs> but you blundered <laughs> badly. <laughs> we uh, we actually had our first major slave labor operation after the burning of the Jap bodies on Gregor at Commander Wan, where we were forced to raise food for the Japs sweet potatoes. The vines were the only nourishing food we got that had any vitamins in them, I guess, but you couldn't chew them. <laughs> Again, they gave us an infinitesimal ration of rice filled with little white worms and stones and debris of all kinds, filth. And as for a soup, we boiled these vines, the potato, sweet potato vines, and you could chew it for a week and you still couldn't chew it down where you could swallow it. But I guess we got something out of it. I remember the soup was a dark green anyway. <laughs> they gave us some vitamins without even thinking of uh, what they were doing. So anyway, there the sanitation again was a horror. The ground was covered with it until an improvisation was created with the permission of the Japs, because again, they were terrified of the disease. The flies were swarming by the billions, the blue bottles. And they issued some lumber, and we had a couple of clever guys who designed a mass <laughs> defecation station <laughs> out of lumber, and they put holes in it in a proper outhouse fashion, and they had a sloping trough under it and a 50-gallon drum at one end of the trough. So here you'd see, God knows how many at once, I'm sure, scores, pooping all at once, and then a fellow was on duty at the 50-gallon drum, and he'd tip it and flush it down to, into a ditch where it would flow out of the camp. And this latrine ditch became the favorite destination of the rats. 
So we supplemented our diet by eating the rats. We would form little groups in camp. And if you were the superhero who managed to kill a rat, you were a leader, sort of. <laughs> so you and your group would boil up that rat in a can, if you could find a can. But the amazing thing was the ability to improvise anything to survive. So we cleaned all the rats out. There were dogs at the beginning wandering through, wild dogs, they were all gone. And actual cats, I believe, too. So anything that moved was gone, and our poop conditions improved to the point that the death rate slowed down dramatically, absolutely dramatically. So at this point, uh, they just started to send off men to Japan to work in the home islands. And one of the first shiploads went off in a ship called the Orioko Maru. Oh, pardon me, that wasn't one of the first. Hold it there. I want to get to that one. Shipload after shipload went off, and we called them the death ships or the hell ships. And I'll just skip briefly over it because it's a story all itself. Almost 6,000 Americans died in the holes of those hell ships. They lie on the bottom of the Pacific. And one of the last of the hell ships to leave Manila, it was rather late in 44, when they were getting desperate for more labor in Japan. And the Americans had already started to bomb the Philippines. So who were the last to go in a hell ship? We were down to the officers who hadn't been sent out. It was the enlisted men that the American higher command gave the Japs on all the previous hell ships. Finally, there was no one left but officers. So 1,700 officers went out on the Orioko Maru from Manila. And it rounded the point to Olongapu, where the big Marine Navy base was located. You know about that, near Clark Field. And as it came around, pardon me, it barely got around the point from Manila Bay when it was hit first by American planes and, and uh, submarines. And when it finally got into close to land at Olongapu, the survivors on it went over the sides and the Japs were machine gunning them in the water. Those that survived finally were packed into a tennis court at the old American base in the blazing sun coated with oil, salt water, and you can imagine what it was like lying on concrete. So God knows that story was in itself a horror tale. And from there, they were transported by truck to another port and went off on another ship, which was sunk. The final ship, the three man, three ship, uh, call it the safari to Japan. The final ship landed in Japan, one of the southern ports, and there were 300 who managed to survive out of the 1700. And as they came through this village, the inhabitants who were supposed to cheer the Japanese army for their marvelous superiority were crying. And one of our guys wrote a wonderful book about that. Forgive us uh, our trespasses. He wound up a doctor, got home, went to med school in France. Unbelievable. One of his relatives lived there and brought him over. Anyway. Well, what, was your, uh, what was a typical day like? And typical day? There was no typical day. <laughs> well, at Commander Watt it was farming, naked, loincloth, that's all you had for clothing. The ground was brutally hard on your feet. It was like walking on sharp stones. So after that farming experience for the Japs, 
at Commander Wan and going off for the slave ship from Manila, I was one of the lucky ones. I got on one of the early slave ships. And I'm almost sure it was around March of 44 when mine left. I can't remember the name of it, but I call it for laughs the Benjo Maru, because they were all Maru's, and Benjo was the uh, defecation place. So I called it the Benjo Maru. <laughs> they were all ships that they confiscated when they marched south and took over all of Southeast Asia. Anyway, when we landed in Japan, we were on a northern port, and we came down the gangplank, and they flanked us with the largest physical specimens they had. They must have been fellows from the northern island of Hokkaido, I believe, because they were much larger than the ordinary Japanese at that time. They seemed to be head and shoulders over them. And it was to impress us with their superiority. And they were staging, filming another propaganda film as we came off. And the cameras were rolling. So it was all staged. And we were assigned to a place called Hitachi. They, the, that was the factory town of the mighty Hitachi Corporation on the coast. Hitachi is the Japanese General Electric, you know. Much larger than General Electric today, with our help. And they had mines behind the factory city, which is there, Hitachi City on the coast. And they had copper mines in the hills behind it. So that's where I started copper mining deep rock way down. A very short time there, and then they sent me and a bunch of fellows on to a place called Ashio, run by the Furukawa Corporation, another copper mine way into the Jap Alps. And there were approximately five or six hundred Americans there. You want to know about my daily experience. Well, there it was, again, a story in itself. Before dawn, the Jap guards would come through the wooden shacks that we were packed into on three wooden platforms, and you were given approximately, I'd say, a foot, about a foot and a half of space for each body shoulder to shoulder, looked exactly the same as the inmates at Auschwitz on the platforms. That was our sleeping arrangement on bamboo. And the bed bugs were in the millions, if not billions. Bed bugs, lice, and fleas. So you'd wake up in the morning covered with blood from crushing them. And they'd whack you on the feet. This is before dawn. And you were to roll out and shigoto, that was work, work. The only heat in the barracks, the winter of 44, were lumps of charcoal. They would issue two or three lumps to each barracks so you'd see a glow in the dark. <laughs> there was no actual heat. The bodies, it was like a cowboy, kept each other relatively warm. So we'd march, uh, fast forwarding to the winter, we'd march through the snow up to your waist waist deep, barefooted, with cotton, they issued us cotton uniform, top and bottom, and we marched to the uh, mine shaft in the village, and they packed us into a bucket which held over 20 of us, packed in with a uh, small barricade which came up to approximately your waist and the shaft was raw rock with water running down it constantly. And the bucket had a spring on top, a massive spring with a rusty cable attached to it. And the Jap running the steam winch would, when you were packed in to full capacity, drop, open the winch wide and drop the cable as <laughs> as fast as it would go, till you hit about 1,900 feet, and then he would hit the brake and bounce you. And he did that every morning for the, 
This is for laughs. He got a big charge out of it. So we were waiting every morning for that cable to snap, <laughs> to go the rest of the way down the shaft. We got to the bottom. We were in tunnels that were built in the uh, 16th century. A Jack Baron had opened the mine in 1580-something, as I recall. The mine at Ascio closed up before the war because it was worked out, but they had cheap labor, so they opened it again to scratch any copper they could get out of it. Anyway, it was like the famous Dante Inferno down there in the total blackness and very, very uh, low height designed for the Japanese of the 16th century, who averaged probably around four and a half feet, I would think. And the tunnels weren't that much higher. So we were walking bent over through them. We were, again, dressed in those cotton uniforms and barefooted, but it was warmer down there. It would average 50 odd degrees. <laughs> and we performed all sorts of bloody, brutal manual labor with primitive tools, some that looked like they came out of the prehistoric era. And I won two or three of the greatest jobs. One was assisting the Jap powder monkey. And Americans would actually, these were fellows from the deep south, most of them, volunteered to run drills, six foot long drill bits. And they would drill the holes in the head of the face of the rock, and this chap, Potter Monkey, would pack the, the dynamite in with wires, so he wired them all together. And he'd fill up each hole with as many sticks as he could, all wired together, and filled all the holes in to one main twisted wire fuse, and he would light that with his cigarette. When he sucked on the cigarette, when it glowed red enough, he would touch it to the fuse, and I would be squatting next to him because I couldn't move until he said so. And he would wait until the fuse was burning beautifully before giving me permission to get the hell out of it. And we would walk slowly down the main tunnel and into a lateral and squat. And by the time we squatted, the explosion went off. He had it timed perfectly. <laughs> and the blast would come by you. <laughs> This went on and on and on, over and over. So you did this seven days a week? Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was no canteen or PX. <laughs> then I had a great detail, like another one, hauling shoring timbers on my back up 100-foot shafts between levels. So they would attach this uh, roughly probably five, five and a half, six-foot shoring timber about six inches thick on my back with ropes. And I had to climb this, this uh, steep wooden ladder in this narrow, narrow shaft up to the next level. And when the shoring timber popped above that level, the Jap up there was supposed to grab it and help pull me out with the timber. But he would deliberately let me hang there, of course. That was another sport. And many of the rungs on this ladder would be gone. So you'd reach for a step and it wouldn't be there. And then you had an illumination. You had a carbide lamp around your neck. Carbide is the chunks of stone and the water would drip from the top and the gas would be lit. And that would be the illumination. You'd have it hooked to your uniform. That was your only source of illumination. And you prayed you didn't drop it going up because then you'd be in total darkness, 2,000 feet below the surface. So I felt for those miners in South America. And finally, finally, the spring came. <laughs> we knew that we wouldn't see another winter. This is spring of 1945. Right. And as the days grew warmer, the lice grew stronger. <laughs> the ration got smaller. <laughs> they would feed us whatever grain they could find in warehouses filled with dirt, worms, so on. 
Sometimes it would be pure horse cord. Sometimes we actually got soybeans, which was a miracle. It was about two days we got soybeans. But again, you couldn't digest them, raw soybeans, boiled, but they still were indigestible because our bodies weren't used to it, too much protein. So that would cause more diarrhea and so on. And once we were issued shark's intestines filled with creatures, of course. And I got that detail, cleaning out the shark's intestines in a freezing water. I remember this, and, and the, this crap that we cleaned out of them. <laughs> and another time we were issued old horse bones. <laughs> and our cooks had these huge iron pots so they could cook anything. So I remember they boiled the horse's bones for a long time to get whatever possible good there was in them. And then when they finished boiling them for God knows how long, they would crack the bones to get the marrow out and boil them some more. And the skulls, of course. So these were little incidents you always remember. <laughs> Let me ask a question here. Um, as the war drew to a close, yeah. did you have any indication that things were changing other than that the food was worse? And Very good question. American aircraft started flying over B-29s, and the Japs would yell, B Nijuku, B Nijuku, and they were terrified. Their faces turned white. They'd heard what the, Maya, the B-17s were doing. Never mind atomic bombs, the fire raids were fantastic. We killed far more in the fire raids than the atomic bombs killed. Children don't know about that because all they're told is atomic bombs are bad, atomic energy is bad. It's the only thing that's going to save us energy-wise is atomic energy. But anyway, this, the panic among the Japs, you could smell it. And we started breathing slightly, a slight sigh, uh, we may live. This possibly we may live. So, finally it became that great day, August 14th, and we got the word to the Jap commander from Tokyo, give them the day off, because the emperor is going to speak. And we were huddled around the Japanese commander's headquarters in the camp. And the cook they had was a Chinese fellow with a wooden leg who had been on an English freighter and he was the only survivor. A big fat fellow. Xing Li was his name from Xinwen Tao. <laughs> and he had families also in Shanghai and Tsingtao. Tsingwen Tao, Tsingtao, and Tsingwen Tao. And he was my buddy when I had a chance to talk to this Chinese guy. He enjoyed talking with me. And he'd say, Crowley San, you full of bullshit. <laughs> that was his favorite expression. <laughs> and he grew fatter and fatter and fatter. He ate all the Japs' food. He'd boil a can full of rice for the Jap officers, but he ate most of it. <laughs> and he'd regale me with tales of his family. Say. So, we, we, we heard the strange sound the emperor speak. And Ching Tao came, uh, Chin Li came running out of the headquarters yelling when he saw me, Crowley son, war over. <laughs> Emperor, speak. Go ahead. What, what? So here we were now, stuck up there in the Jap Alps, didn't know where the hell we were, and our interpreter, the Japanese interpreter, was an ex-valet of the American ambassador Drew. And he spoke perfect English, of course. And he warned us, do not leave the camp. These bad men will kill you. And all the nasty guards were pulled out and young kids looked like Boy Scouts were sent in. So we certainly didn't feel any animosity to them. And they didn't know what the hell they were doing anyway. And the American planes started bombing us with food then. The B-29s were dropping improvised platforms with, with chutes on them that 
didn't slow them down. And when the platforms would hit the ground, they would just splash all over the hillside outside our camp. Many of the camps were the bomb, the bomb, the the uh, plane loads of food on these improvised wooden platforms. would kill American prisoners. And some lost legs when they were hit with these things. But they had to get us food in a hurry. And I'll never forget, we picked up all of these various canned goods that we could and poured them into our cooking pots and made one massive stew. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a lot of chocolate, so we just stuffed ourselves for weeks. We stayed there from August 14th to September, roughly September 4th, I believe it was, when a train came up from Yokohama with one Jap engineer running the train, no Americans, and he pulled into the station at the mining town, and we loaded up the train and headed for Yokohama. And all the way down, we were throwing candy to the children who seemed to appear out of nowhere at every station. They knew we were coming. And we showered them with candy. So you went to Yokohama then? You were transshipped? Yokohama rushed us up to Atsuji Airport after being deloused <laughs> and interviewed and Unfortunately, we had put on so much weight in a hurry from this, in these three weeks, from this rich American food that we, we just ballooned up with this fast fat. So when the Americans interviewed us, they said, well, you look like you were treated pretty damn well. So I remember one fellow I knew who they called a damn liar when he told them what they were fed. Yeah, they actually were nasty, brutal to him. Said, you're a damn liar. No one could look like you. Yeah. See? Ignorance. We were rushed up to Atsuji Airport. That was the main Japanese airfield. And uh, I believe it's still in operation, isn't it? Atsuji. And that was because MacArthur wanted to get us out of Japan to hurry before we performed some nasty act towards Japanese people. <laughs> so they were flying us out in C-54s that hadn't been serviced in God knows how long. The crew chief on the one I was on told me, we're so far ahead of any servicing and maintenance, he said, I hope we make it. We lost two engines on the way to Okinawa. I remember those two engines feathering well. I'll never forget the sound. <laughs> and I remember asking him, most of the guys were asleep. And I said, do you think we'll make it? He said, I sure as hell hope so. But the C-54 with a full load flew on with two engines. And when we landed in Okinawa, the runway had CBs lighting it to greet us. And they didn't have any cigarettes. And we had this huge supply now of Red Cross cigarettes. So we're giving them all to the CBs. How about that? Then we flew on to Manila. Manila, again, it was a tent city for weeks. If you wanted a beer, you could draw an advance on your back pay. So you could buy a bottle of very expensive Filipino beer. <laughs> Outrageously priced. We went into town once in Manila to a restaurant that had been in business pre-war called Tom's Dixie Kitchen. Tom was a Spanish-American war veteran. And here he was cranked up again, didn't take him long to get going, and he was serving chicken, which was nothing but bones, of course, and his, his customers were primarily officers because they, they had the money. And he was charging, I'll never forget it, $35 for that scrawny chicken. And I know the two or three guys I was with were looked down on by the officers in the room, in the dining room. How dare you be here among a, 
your betters. That was their attitude. Yeah. It never changes. <laughs>